Good afternoon, everyone. This is James Rattray, Chairman of the Soldiers of Killy Cranky Group. And taking you through the story of the Battle of Killy Cranky. Um, and I'm using two primary sources of people who were there at the time. The first book is written by General Hugh Mackay, the commander of the Scottish Government Army, supporter of William and Mary, the monarchs. On the Jacobite side, I have Cameron of Lochiel's detailed account of the battle. He's a supporter of James VII. And I'm also using the book, The Art of Warfare in the Age of Marlborough. And this tells us about how armies would have fought at that time, the regular armies, that is. And that fills in the bits that the other two books don't cover. The, the other thing I'm doing but they have changed slightly this time, is we've had filming issues with the camera. In that, at the moment I'm now facing the camera, I can't see what's going on. Uh, whereas the first two sessions, I could see what was going on, but you were getting a mirror image of the background, which was causing huge amounts of confusion. The Castle of Killy Cranky, when I stood there on Thursday, you were getting, you're seeing a mirror image of the past, which didn't look right. So I'm now standing at the front. Kathy, my wife, is behind being cameraman, something that she's very unfamiliar with. But anyway, here goes. In the first two sessions, we talked about why there were two monarchs fighting for Scotland, who their two commanders were for their two armies, two Scottish armies, got to remember, and why the two armies were racing to get to the castle at Blair and what each army leaves behind and in the last session we talked about the Highland Army's War Council and some of the key decisions that they made at that time. So where am I standing this time? Well let me first of all show you where we are in Scotland. This is Edinburgh, this is Glasgow Inverness is at the top here and we are right bang in the middle and that's where Killy Cranky, Pitlochry, Blair Athol is in relation to the rest of Scotland. Fantastic location to tour the whole Scotland with. Let me get that plug in. Going closer, this is showing you where Blair Athol is in relation to where we're standing. This is the Pass of Killy Cranky down here, the National Trust Visitor Centre is here. Soldiers Leap that many of you will know about is here. The A9 that runs through is up here. The B Road and the River Gary is just here. The first filming location was here where I could see the pass and Blair Castle, Castle of Blair. The second filming was standing here looking down into the pass. And for this session, we're standing here right on this flat field some people know it was the Claver House stone where the standing stone was. And I'm going to tell you what happened with this story here. So what I'm going to do now is just take you round the field that I'm standing in. And this field in 1689 was a cornfield. The road that you can see this vehicle coming along, there would have been a track there. It wouldn't have been a proper road and that was the track that people would have followed if they weren't, weren't getting, wanting to get to Blair Athol and the castle there. So this works at the time of the battle. This is a field of corn. I'm going to swing around and just show you one or two features. Up behind here you can see the trees. Well there's a very steep bank there. I suspect it wasn't as heavily covered in trees as it is now. Just behind the two large trees, you can probably just make out the hill at the top, and that's crucial for your understanding of this scene as well. Again, I suspect in 1689 this was much lower. It was clearly from Mackay's account. He could see the bank up here, which we can't see today with that tree growth. Just so panning round again, we're going to just pan round the whole lot until we see the pass of Keely Cranky, which is here, and this is where if you imagine ourselves back then, this is where the army would be coming through. 
I can see there's some of that horrible wind again. We've moved ourselves to try and shelter behind the embankment. I just hope you can hear a thing or two. Kathy's looking at the screen from what she can see without the reflections to see if any comments are coming in. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to pan round again all the way. I'm going to show you the road and the railway line that exists today. And there is a field at the other side, just the other side of the cycling sign that you can see in the heap and sheep. And this all was one field. So going back to where we were. In this session, what I'm going to do is cover why Dundee chose the field of battle and how he manoeuvred General Hugh Mackay's government army into the place that he and his Highlanders, Dundee and his Highlanders, wanted to fight. The last session ended with the Scottish government army, Hugh Mackay's army, William and Mary's army marching through the pass. And we'll join them there. In this session, we will not hear anything from Cameron of Lochiel. So I'm sorry that lovely bonnet will not be on. Like any good commander, Dundee wanted to know the terrain and, and to where he was going to choose to fight the battle. And we know from other accounts that he spoke to the men at Athol to get an understanding. And he decided that this is where he wanted to fight. And so in this session, we're going to be following um, Mackay's account of the battle and got your top of body. And we're going to um, use his words. So just imagine we're standing here in a field of corn, and this is what General Hugh Mackay says. Having passed the five battalions and a troop of horse through the pass, we halted upon a field of corn alongside the river, waiting for the baggage train with Hastings Regiment and the other troop of horse. So everything was coming through. I suspect he felt a degree of relief that he wasn't attacked in the pass and he got the majority of his forces through the pass. And if you just imagine the scene, 2,500 men or whatever, that sort of figure, maybe more than that, on this field here. They would have been organized in clumps by their battalions. He tells us there were five of them. We learnt that when they marched, they lined up a minimum of eight wide, up to 20 wide to get to speed of their marching to get to the place of battle as a group of men. So you can imagine clumps of red coat soldiers and some horse, five of them, big lumps on the field and the horse. And so Mackay goes on. He said he ordered Lieutenant Colonel Lauder to advance with his 200 fusiliers and the troop of horse towards the direction from where he expected the enemy to appear. And he expected them to appear over there because that's where the castle of Blair is. And he then goes on, a party of enemy appeared betwixt us and Blair. We know that this parcel of enemy was commanded by Sir John McLean, 20th chief of Clan McLean, 16th laird of Dewitt on the Isle of Mull. He had 400 men with him. Sir John was a highly educated man, Gallic speaking, English speaking, and also fluent in, in French. He believed keenly in education. He knew education was the future for his clan, and he paid for many of the clan's elder sons to go to university, because he believed that's where the future lay, was in education. And I say this because as I mentioned in the last session, the two armies very much reflect the two societies that lived, existed in Scotland at the time. The Highland Army, Gaelic speaking, very different culture to Mackay's army, which is Lowland Army. And the Highlanders looked down on the Lowlanders. They saw the Lowlanders as drinking too much, which is hard to believe in today's age, considering we always associate drink with the Highlanders. And he also, they also searched associated them with not being fit and they derided them on those base on that basis but let's get back to general Hugh Mackay and and what happens he tells us once he spotted the enemy he galloped up to the ground from whence they were discovered he ordered Colonel Balfour to dispatch quickly his ammunition and put his men under arms 
Love the train. Wasn't around then. Bad luck. <laughs> we'll let, see that very well. Well, he, the general, observed their direction of the enemy and he should choose the field of battle. So Mackay tells us he rushed up from here to the, where the advanced horse were to have a look at the enemy and work out the lie of the land because where he was going to deploy his Scottish government army and battalions ready for the attack from Dundee and his Highlanders. Coming up to the, Hugh Mackay carries on, coming up to the advanced party, he, General Mackay, some small, saw some small parties of the enemy, the matter of a short mile of march. They were moving slowly along the foot of a hill which lay towards Blair, coming towards us. Whereupon he, General Mackay, sent orders to Balfour, Brigadier Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Balfour, to march up to him in all haste with his foot soldiers. So he was expecting an attack down at that end, and that's exactly what Dundee wanted him to expect. But presently he discovered some bodies of men marching down the high hill within a quarter of a mile to the place where he stood. So let me just swing around, and we're going to... That's the hill up there. We can just through the, see through the trees and between those two big trees. We can just see it make it out today. And he goes on. When the gross body of the men, Dundee's main army appeared. So he, all of a sudden, he thought the attack was coming from Blair. And that's exactly why the Macleans were there to hold him on this field. Then all of a sudden, he saw the Highland army up there. And he goes on. Fearing that they should take possession of the eminence or high ground just above the ground where our forces halted. So at that time there weren't all these trees there, there was shrub and bushes and he could see there was a flat plain just slightly above, you know, slightly below the, the tree line that exists there. He said there was a steep and difficult ascent full of trees and shrubs and within a carbide shot of the place where we stood. And he continues, whereby they could undoubtedly force us with their fire in confusion over the river. So his fear was the Highlanders would occupy this immediate ridge that's just up here. And he was concerned was once they fired down on them, it would be very hard to attack them. It's a bit like a rampart to a castle and that they would have to retreat in confusion. So what he tells us is he galloped back in all haste to his forces from the direction that he'd been in to look at the Maclean's, and having made every battalion form the court to conversion to the right upon the ground. So again, you've got to remember these big bodies of men had to be wheeled round and that was called at 90 degrees and that was called a court to conversion. So they, they had a special maneuver of this big body facing in this way, had to move round this way to march up onto the hill in their eight to 20 wide columns of men. And Mackay continues, made them march each up the face of the hill. By this, he prevented, or he, Mackay, prevented that inconvenience of the enemy trapping them between the high ground and the river. So he said he successfully got his troops marching up this hill. And anyone who's been to our soldiers of Killy Cranky events will know how difficult, how steep that hill is, and how everything on there. Um, it's very difficult to march up there, but they got up there. It's interesting, Mackay now has maneuvered him to where he wants to. Because he said he did trapping between the high ground, but got, got to the ground fair enough to receive the enemy, says Mackay, but not to attack them. So Dundee did very successfully maneuvered the, the Williamite Scottish government army into a position that gave him the opportunity. And Mackay continued, we stood on the lowest hill near the river. Dundee had already had possession of the main hill with his back to very high hill. And this, he's now going to have a dig at the Highlanders, as you would expect, and even though he himself was a Highlander. This is the ordinary maxim of Highlanders who never fight against regular forces brought up upon anything of equal terms without a sure retreat at their back particularly if their enemy provided of force equal terms 
interesting we talked in the session two how Dundee had to tell these Highlanders that they shouldn't attack in the past because that was breaching the code of Highland ethics and here we have again Mackay telling us as if the Highlanders were trying to choo choose a uh, an advantage over his forces, which they had done. Maybe that reflects on how they fought on the continent in these big blocks of men. And we'll cover that tomorrow, Tuesday at seven o'clock. And again, he mentions particularly the enemy provided a force. So again, he talks about horse cavalry being the key kingpin in how he could defeat the Highlanders. So I'm going to finish this session here with what's happening as I talk. 1,200 horses are still coming out onto this field and that will be followed by Hastings Regiment who's put there to protect the baggage train, train and one troop of horse and when they'll come out and as they come out the main army has now gone up into the up over this ridge in front of us. Hastings Regiment is the last one through the pass they'll come up and they'll swing around behind these sheep over here up through the trees to the right wing of the army and we'll join them on the front wing on the front line of the army um, on, on Thursday. Tomorrow before we talk about the battle I want to equip you with some information. We need to understand warfare in the 1690s. We need to understand the difference between the two armies. One was a conventional army three Dutch brigade regiments and the Dutch at that time were considered to be the most advanced in warfare in Europe here and along with three other battalions with them and how these armies in Europe and Mackay would have fought so see you tomorrow at seven o'clock